Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. Today, we have a Q&A session uh, once again with our guest expert on Russian and Soviet small arms, Max Popienko, whose name I am slowly getting better at. <laughs> so, uh, from all of the awesome patrons who support Forgotten Weapons, I have a couple pages of questions here that we are going to go through. So. Uh, Max, why don't we uh, jump right into these? Our first question is from Michael, who says, uh, the Colt Model 1911 Russian contract, and he spells it out in Cyrillic, which I can't read, of the 51,100 Colt... English order. That one, yes. Of the 51,100 Colt 1911 pistols sent to Imperial Russia during World War I, are many seen around Russia. They're very, fairly rare in the United States. Where have they all gone? I think most were lost, you know, during the war, First World War, when the revolution, when the civil war, very few survived, mostly in museums or in some, very, in some private collections. They are seldom seen, so like, sold like deactivated guns. And if they are sold, it's very expensive items. Oh, that's too bad. But so. Most were lost, unfortunately. Okay, that, that does happen during wars. Uh, our next question is from John, uh, who actually has two questions, so let's address these one at a time. Uh, first, I'd like to ask for clarification on the acceptance standard uh, for the Dragunov. In the SVD video, Max was referring to 10 round groups at, fired at 100 meters, not exceeding nine centimeters dispersion, but the page you reproduced uh, at the 17 minute mark in the video had 500 meters underlined in red, just a clarification about what we were looking at. And I'm not sure, because once again, I yeah. can't read that document. The second page, which was showing the figure for uh, 500 meters, was for a field manual. It's actually a table that showed maximum no number of shots the experienced shooter has to make to engage a specific target at specific range. Okay, so that's kind of a cool thing you don't normally get in English uh, sort of manuals of, you know, if your target's this far, you should be able to get them with X number of shots. Yeah, so it's just, basically it's in most Russian uh, technical manuals for AK, for machine guns, for SVD. It says that a specific range, a specific target, target should require no more than specific number of shots. Of course, it, standard range type condition, not in real combat, but it's sort of a qualification requirement. Okay, cool. Uh, and then John's second question was, my main question uh, is about the elevation knob on the PSO-1 scope. Being a bullet drop compensator and snipers switching back and forth between LPS and 7N1, uh, which ammunition was it actually calibrated for? You see the 7N1 Bullet bullet was designed to have the same weight as LPS. So for all practical ranges, we are ma matching ballistically. So you cannot really expect to hit anything with LPS ball. So it's only for 7N1 or 7N14. So, and even then, you, you need a lot of luck to hit anything at this range. But for all practical purposes, the LPS and 7 and 1 are ballistically matching. So it's almost the same bullet weight, so almost the same trajectory. So okay. the same adjustments. All right. And his last question is about the metascope in the first model PSO-1 used to uh, detect infrared light. Uh, what was the reason to include this feature? Did it have something to do with the US Army fielding the M3 carbine and its infrared sniper scope in the Korean War? Probably, yes. That's be besides, there was a lot of active infrared devices installed on tanks, on armored vehicles. Mm. So the chance to disable enemy's infrared projector, to limit enemy's ability to see you in, in the dark, also has a very practical purpose. So they were told that it's mostly this, to engage the enemy's active infrared seekers. So this regard, personal or vehicle mounted or say, uh, crew supported weapons. So you just see a big infrared scope, infrared projector through a scope, you just shoot at it because it probably means some sort of danger. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, next question is from Commander31, 
says, is it true that the quality of Ismash produced AK rifles deteriorated significantly during and after Perestroika? Well, um, early 90s were very hard times across the Russia. Uh, most of industry, Russian industry, most, in Russian society had a fall, fall on bad times. And yes, there were a lot of complaints about quality of many products, not only Ismash AKs. And so, this was general opinion of the soldiers back during the Chechen wars, that they often preferred to get the old Soviet era rifles uh, instead of newly product, produced rifles. But the situation has changed. So the perestroika has ended toward the early 200s. I think the situation improved greatly. There still can be some complaints about civilian guns, especially in regards of external looks. And, but uh, mostly in regard of materials, workmanship, the uh, situation certainly improved from the 90s. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see, next up is from Brandon. He says, uh, when the Soviets, or were the Soviets directly influenced by the 5.56, uh, from seeing its use by the United States in Vietnam, or were they on their way to developing a small bore cartridge independently? Well, basically, in the early attempts were made as uh, before the World War, before Great Patriotic War. In 1941, there was experimental cartridge, uh, 5.6 millimeter caliber, but it was very high velocity, it's like a 22 NATO early, something very fast and powerful. But uh, practical work on the assault rifle, on reduced caliber assault rifle cartridge began in 1959. So it's 1960. When the published reports were, when the Americans began to publish reports on a new promising infantry cartridge, Promising. So it was actually before the uh, Vietnam War. Okay. When the uh, Soviet Army, Soviet experts received actual uh, trophies, actual M16 rifles from Vietnam, they already had their own prototypes so to, to check a gut, to check against, to see how they perform, how they perform one to each other. Okay, but it sounds like it was a reaction to American yes, experiments. Certainly, it was a reaction to American developments, but just before the war. Okay. Uh, let's see. Bjorn says, "Why aren't there any English language reference, like detailed, serious books on Russian small arms, specifically the Mosin, the SKS, the SVT thirty-eight and forty? Is translation too hard? Uh, not enough bilingual experts in the area of the field." Or is it just too hard for foreigners to access historical documentation in Russia? You see, before the last year, before a couple of years ago, there were, there were no, no Russian accounts, detailed Russian accounts, on either Tokarev or Mosin. So only during recent years we've seen a very good published books on Tokarev from the Chumak and a couple of very good books on the Mosin, also from Chumak, on early development and adoption of Mosin, and from an hour after the case. Unfortunately, I cannot remember, but it's my book, book case. On the model 1981-30, but there is still a huge gap in between, and there is still a lot of development. So someone has to reach out to the publisher. All those books are from the same publisher, from Atlant Books in St. Petersburg, and to check if someone is willing to translate those books into English. They will be invaluable to English-speaking collectors, but it's a huge labor because the books are big and very information-heavy. Yeah, I... If someone is really willing to try and do translation, you can contact me, and I'll get you in touch with the publisher directly. Okay. Um, 
is there much interest in Russia for books like this? Um, like, uh, I think yes, because the first edition of the Tokarev books was sold rather quick, and the second edition, which has improved and expanded, is already sales pretty good. So yes, because you know both Tokarev and Mosin can be purchased as a converted legal legal civilian writings. Right. So there is a lot of practical interest. You can you can even collect. You can get a collector license, and you can try to collect different Mosin rifles and different Tokarev rifles. Or at least you can buy one. It's not as expensive, and go and shoot it and read about it history and development. Okay. Well, hopefully we will be able to get some of those translated into English. I have the both of those books myself, but I can't read them. So, <laughs> uh, Anthony says, are there any official Russian texts or trials on the Czech VZ-58 uh, or any reports on why Czechoslovakia developed that instead of the AK? That certainly should be reports on SA-58. Because all wars of popped weapons were tested by a Soviet military. And I know that some reports on uh, SA-23, submachine gun of Czechoslovakia regime, were published in Russian mm -hmm. gun press several years before. But uh, SA-58 is still maybe classified, maybe just no one got down to the dig it up and publish it. But there certainly should be reports, official reports on it. Do you know what the Russian military, the Soviet military, um, thought on that rifle was? Did they like it? Did they not like it? Do you have any idea? Well, I don't know. I know people who use it, it mostly liked it because it was light, and it was cool, comfortable. So I never heard a lot of complaints. But a general opinion was. If you really have to go in the worst parts of the world, you need maximum reliability. You better to go with Kalashnikov. But it could be as much uh, technical truth as a national pride. So. Okay. Uh, James says, when watching the countless documentaries on the Eastern Front during the, the Second World War, you often see dozens of Soviet soldiers riding on tanks in column and all the infantry have submachine guns. So my question is, were the submachine guns that commonly issued by the second half of the conflict? Or was this more propaganda to give a, a different you know, vision of what people were armed with? You see, the Soviet industry produced more than six millions of Spagin, the Pesha 41 alone plus almost 1 million of Sudayev PPS-43. So yes, they are very widely used. As part of it was special small infantry units, assault units, armed entirely with spiking submachine guns and riding tanks. So we were, the task was to protect tanks from the infantry, from the grenade launcher, from the Panzerfaust, from the Panzerschreck, and to the, keep it up with assaulting tanks and disperse and engage German in a close combat. Okay. So yes, okay. it was really widely used. Okay, six million, that's as many as we made M1 Garand rifles, so. Yes, yes, actually I believe uh, M1 Garands were made about four million, so it was six million M1 carbines. Okay, uh, let's see. Santaroga says, is there a good source in either language for a detailed development history, deployment history, and variations on the Russian SKS? Unfortunately, no, not yet. Are you going to write it? Um, I don't know. I'm more interested in like, you know, more broad spectrum books, because uh, that's way you need to do a monography on this specific gun, you need a lot of time actually digging in various archives so to go to Tula, to Izhevsk, to Podolsk, and it's probably that's a task for a retired person. I <laughs> still have about 25 years before my retirement. Makes sense. Well, hopefully the guys doing some of the other books will take on the SKS as a project. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, let's see, David. David says, uh, the Americas have a history of having unrealistic trial requirements like the SBIW, ACR, OICW, et cetera. From an external perspective, the Soviets always seem to be much more practical. Is this actually the case or is this just something that we're seeing? Well, in part, yes. In some part, it was, yes, uh, more practical. But uh, in quite a lot of cases, of fa failed cases, they're just not published because in Soviet Union, uh, everything was classified. So even successful developments were kept under secrecy and you get very little info about developments, about successes and failures. So you, it's just not, we're good, just not, we were not advertising. Okay, we are going to keep, uh, to have a lot, a new trial for a new super pooper assault rifle, which will be superior to everybody else. So just, just watch the, like uh, my, my parades on the Red Square and one year see hop. Oh, our guys are having uh, some new rifle or some new tank or some new ballistic missile. But you have very little, had very little info. Sometimes no info at all. Okay. Now, that makes sense. The combination of sometimes more realistic trials and then the ones that weren't, you never hear about. Uh, Lubosch says every country in the Eastern Bloc was building or buying Soviet small arms except Czechoslovakia, which almost always went the other way. Um, I guess this is actually kind of similar to the, the question we already touched on. Yes. Um, is there, I'm going to twist his question a little bit. Do you know why it was that Czechoslovakia sort of alone didn't use the AK and the other standard Soviet weapons? Honestly, I don't have idea. It was probably for them, but it was a matter of uh, a national pride. Okay. So I know that other countries tried to develop their own guns, like Poland, for example, Polish produced their own pistols. Mm -hmm. So I think so, so Soviets, okay, if you can make a weapon almost as good or as good as ours and firing the same ammunition, okay, go ahead. But if you don't have resources, okay, you can have a license of from IK or Makarov and so on. Okay, that also makes sense. Um, Kurosovat says, what are your thoughts on the AK-12 and the AK-15? Well, I'm going to buy a civilian version of AK-12 in 545 as soon as it's shipped to the shelves. So I guess I can say I like it. I like them both. Okay. Um, any particular reason why? Those are the, the balanced recoil guns, right? No, 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 no. It's a, it's a great updated classic Kalashnikovs, but I really like the uh, diopter side. Mm. I like the adjustable telescoping shoulder stock because I have a long arms. And uh, I like the feel of the gun. So it's free floated barrel. And actually, I found that I'm shooting it better with iron sights, with doctor sights, than with red dot sights. Huh. So I certainly need to uh, rifle with iron sight just to shoot it. Okay. What is the difference between the 12 and the 15? Uh, 12 is 5.45 and 15 is 7.62. It's, uh, ah, I probably should have 15 known is mostly for special forces or what? Troops who are operating uh, the country, which still uses 7.62. Okay. That one 1911 guy wants to know uh, what was the purpose of the Groza and other 9 by 39 millimeter rifles like the VSS and the SR3? Well, they all have their own specific uh, purposes. The VSS, the original 9 millimeter sniper rifle, was designed as a special forces suppressed weapon. So, sort of, sort of super uh, submachine gun firing suppressed ammunition. It is much more powerful than any 9mm or 45 caliber submachine gun, almost as quiet, shoots farther. So it was specific uh, Spitznas weapon. A surfery a compact version, was originally a specific uh, CQB weapon. 
It's uh, for VIP protection, for concealed carry because it's really short. And for operation, like confined spaces, like room clearing and so on, because nine millimeter bullet is much more powerful than any pistol bullet. And you can use armor, pin, armor piercing bullets if your opponents are wearing body armor or if you're shooting at the guys sitting in the car. And Graza was sort of uh, attempt to make uh, a one gun to, could make it all because it was a bullpup. But it was made in very limited numbers and not, was, was not really successful because it was a conversion of AK style weapon into bullpup layout. And such conversions are always have a lot of issues, like with ergonomics, balance, and so on. Okay. Uh, Grayson says, what information do you have, <clears throat> and this is something I get asked a lot, on the levered delayed TKB 517 in competition with the AKM? From what information is on the internet, it's supposed to have been superior to the AKM, but was rejected because of familiarity with the AK system by that point. Interesting, interested to know uh, how accurate this is, especially since it's such an unusual action. Well, I have in my, some of my books actual numbers, which says that uh, Korobov rifle had a less dispersion in full automatic than AKM. But the problem is any delayed blowback gun is less reliable than a gas-operated weapon. So you have a lot of fall because of early opening. Okay. You had a lot of falling inside the receiver. Besides that, it's very sensitive to the material and coating of the case. So you use brass, yes, like you know, it's case, in case with the French rifle. So they tuned the FAMAS to the steel cased ammunition, and they had a lot of issues with the brace, with the brass cased cartridges. So the same was with the curve. So if you have, for example, use foreign ammunition, which has a brass case, you know, Finnish or Chinese and so on, you're bound to have issues. With a gas-operated gun, it done, doesn't care if it's steel or brass or anything else. So basically, it was reliability, especially under harsh conditions. Okay. Uh, Chaddy says, was there a Russian equivalent in use or in development to the North Korean helicoil uh, magazines for AKs, the, that drum, like the bison? 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 As far as I know, no. Their development for pistol caliber ammunition, but for rifle caliber ammunition, it's just too heavy and too unreliable. So as far as I know, uh, for high capacity magazines, the people working on flat pens or on drums, but not on a helical magazines because they are too expensive, too complicated, too unreliable. And we should be clear that no one, as far as I know, no one's really sure that those North Korean magazines are actually real and functional and not just yeah. fake. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, Noah says, where did the majority of the Papasha 41 submachine guns end up after the USSR adopted the, the Sudayev? Wikipedia gives a very rudimentary explanation. I'm interested to hear from someone with some insider knowledge. You see, uh, PPS 43 was never intended to replace the Pasha. Uh -huh. It was intended to serve side by side. So the Pasha was a standard infantry gun. It's wooden stock, high capacity drum. It, stick magazine, so on. It was like a standard issue. The PPS was intended for vehicle crews, for recon units, for, for airborne units, for people who need a more compact, more maneuverable weapon. So they served side by side. So actually, most of the PPS were kept until the end of the war and for quite a lot of years afterwards. A lot of were given up to the Warsaw Pact countries, to the China, a lot were sent to the Africa, to the other, other countries which got support from Soviet Union. So a lot were scrapped or just put into the storage. It would seem to me that the Sudayev is kind of a better gun in every way than the, the Spagen. Yes, it was. The problem was that uh, there weren't um, even people who were in command who, who made the decision 
uh, didn't want uh, interruption in production because uh, war needed all the guns you can make. So it was better to have a lot of maybe not so good guns but shipped to the front every day, but to have a, just a gap before you can switch production from one gun to a better gun. All right, we had a little bit of a, a hiccup there in the connection, but I think we had your whole answer, Max. So we will move on to our next question, which is from The Full Nine. It says, why has Russia avoided aperture sights for so long on most military weapons? Is it mostly due to those darn wobbly dust covers on AKs? Well, I don't know why. Uh, they are avoiding, so probably it was just easier to clean the open site on the aperture site. The diopter site. The diopter site began to appear only in the 80s during the Abakan trials. They, they really decided that they need more accuracy. Okay. I don't know that uh, the question is entirely fair because it's not like Russia is the only country that has stuck with open sites instead of apertures. They, they're around on a lot of other uh, modern rifles or Cold War era rifles at least. Uh, Will says, what was the Soviet procurement of small arms, was the Soviet procurement of small arms as hampered by politics and bureaucracy as that of the United States? For example, the disaster of U.S. development and adoption of the M14. Did you have issues like that as well? Well, you see a lot of history is still buried in archives and papers and so on. But there were like uh, bureaucratic struggles between various pow powers in military and in industrial complex, <coughs> struggles between factories to get orders, just over delays, for example, when we were talking about PKM, Kalashnikov machine gun development, it was one of the reasons the PKM was developed because Tula was dragging its feet on development of Nikonov, or Nikitin machine gun. So it just a little bit lazy, just taking their time to refine it, to polish the things, and military wanted to speed up a process. So most of this, you see the small arms are like a small problem. So there was a lot of bureaucratic and power struggle issues with the larger systems like tanks and so on, but it's not our topics today to discuss. Okay. Uh, Joel says, rumors in the West often suggest that very early versions of the SKS went through some field trials with Soviet troops towards the end of World War II. And I've, I've heard this as well, people suggesting that there were SKSs in the Battle of Berlin. Um, is there any truth or evidence to support this? You see, there was uh, SKS before SKS. So actually, oh. Simonov designed the first prototype, or later evolved into SKS, in 1941. It was a carbine firing a standard 7.62 X. 54 remote ammunition. It was okay. technically in even externally very similar to the older SKS we know. It was actually produced in small number uh, for troop trials, uh, I believe about uh, 1944. But uh, SKS carbines which fired intermediate ammunition, model of 1943, were field tested shortly after the victory in the summer of 1945. Okay. That would explain the different, uh, there's always, there's usually like a little little kernel of truth at the, the heart of some of those rumors and that would explain it. Uh, Keegan says, uh, what was the extent of the Russian naval infantry's use of the SVT-40 in World War II? Uh, were they more effective fighting troops or worse? Uh, why did they have more, more or less uh, Tokarev rifles compared to the rest of Russian forces. You see, not, not, naval infantry was not like a marine corps in the United States. Naval infantry was sailors from the ships that cannot fight, which were sent to fight on the ground. Hmm. So sailors were usually more technically savvy people. 
because we had to be trained on machinery. So we were recruited from the better China people. So we, so we had more in training to properly maintain top rifles. So we, we can okay. keep, keep better care of the rifles. And we were known for you know, fierce fighting. So like the Germans nicknamed them the Black Devils because we wore black uniforms. And yes, we we're, we're, we're used top rifles a lot. That makes sense. Uh, Ferris says, ultimately, what led the Soviet Union to adopt 9x18 Makarov uh, other than adopting... You know, da, 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 da. Oh, ultimately, what, basically, why did the Soviet Union adopt 9x18 Makarov in, as a replacement for the 7.62 Tokarev cartridge? You see, the 7.60 Tokarev was deemed to be too powerful for a pistol. Because mm. the experience of the war, of the Great Patriotic War, showed that pistols were often more dangerous to their owners than the mm. enemy, because of a lot of negligent discharges and so on. Because suicides or just negligent or unintended discharges. So we wanted a pistol very safe in handling and to be a short range, because you cannot expect officer to hit anything far enough, say five or six steps. So you don't need that kind of power if you need only pistol round. If you need round that you need for pistol and submachine gun, then yes, 7.62 and 9 millimeter Luger is good. But if you need it only for a pistol for a last ditch weapon, so it's something like a 9.9 micro is was considered sufficient. Okay, makes sense. The British did the same thing when they went from 45 to 38 caliber revolvers. Just nobody could hit anything with the bigger gun anyway, so. Yeah. All right, we are on to our third and final page here. Uh, we have Hard Zero asking, uh, do you think 9 by 39 will continue to see service as it is? Uh, and the family of guns that shoot it, are they, are they going to be replaced by 9mm submachine guns and regular AKs? Well, I think it's, it will keep, it will be kept in use. There's no way a 9mm pistol ammunition can replace the 9x39 ammunition <coughs> as a super uh, subsonic uh, suppressed gun cartridge. So actually, VTSSM is more more like a police uh, special forces weapon. It's all like a police patrol weapon. Uh, nine x nine millimeter subsonic is much more powerful, and uh, some new guns being developed or improved for this cartridge for special forces use. So I'm not seeing it going away anytime soon. It seems kind of like a, a similar cartridge to the 300 Blackout. With yes, that. yes, in, in some sense, yes. Uh, Aki says, I think by now everyone knows what Finland did with Russian uh, or and Soviet weapons, captured or otherwise. We know that the Soviets copied what he says is the perfect submachine gun drum magazine. Is there anything else in the Finnish equipment inventory uh, that the Soviet Union took or adopted? Well, I think uh, the Soviets copied the huge uh, filling cup for a Maxim machine guns from a Finnish. Mm. The one in which you can uh, fill the jacket with a handful of snow. That's true. That was a Finnish thing originally, wasn't it? Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I can't remember anything else. Okay. Over here. <laughs> in the U.S., there is a perception, although usually uninformed, of the AK being grossly inaccurate or the SKS being a cheap throwaway weapon. Are there any preconceived notions like this regarding Western weapons in the Soviet or in the Russian? Yes, of course, weapon? of course, we are. So mostly people think, that, okay, M16 or R15 are much more accurate than AK, but much less reliable. So it's basically inverted situation, or maybe it's the same. But if you actually get a standard A-15 and standard say, civilian Saiga in mm -hmm. same caliber, like 
two to three Remington and shoot the same ammunition, you get rather close results. So it's yeah. maybe if you, of course, if you shoot something like a Wilson Combat or like, I don't know, uh, some GPA, GPR, like expensive R15 match rifles, of course, you get much better reliability. But if you shoot something which is close to the military issue gun, you get the same about two to four minutes of angle accuracy, good ammunition. Problem is that uh, Soviet and Russian ammunition, the cheap ammunition is not so good and always increases dispersion beyond the capabilities of the gun. Right, yeah, we have, we have that same ammunition here and a lot of people really like it because it's cheaper than the alternatives. Yes. Uh, Samuel says, if the SVD was a designated marksman's rifle, what was the standard sniper rifle in the, the Soviet inventory, if there was one? Well, mostly no. Okay. So the first uh, sniper rifles, really bolt action sniper rifles, high precision rifles, were developed after the fall of the Soviet Union, like SV-98 uh, <coughs> or MC-116. It's the products of late, late 90s and early 2000s, when it was need for a highly precision rifles for most of the law enforcement, for counter-terrorism work, for police special operations. Okay. And now people getting like American-style sniper teams, American-style producing, local, locally producing American-style precision bolt-action rifles, but it's still in development mostly. Okay. How long did the like the PU Mosin Nagant stay in service? Which gun? Sorry. Uh, the Mosin Nagant sniper. Oh, uh, it was officially retracted from service with the introduction introduction of SVD. But oh. I have seen photos, and I know that people used it during Chechen wars for lack of SVDs. Okay. Mostly special police units. Okay. Uh, we have two questions left. The next one is from Andrew, who says, what is the status of the 12.7 by 55 millimeter subsonic round? Is it actually in service in any significant manner in Russia? Um, and is it accurate enough to function in a sniping role as defined in the West? Uh, used only for special, mostly special law enforcement teams, or special police teams for me used against terrorists or against their organized crime. So it's, uh, it's really used. I don't have a specific numbers for accuracy, but I believe that out to three or 400 meters, you can surely hit a bad guy and make sure that he won't be not be <laughs> being a bad anymore because with 50 caliber bullets, that's a lot of punch even at subsonic velocities. No, okay. Was it, I have to apologize, I know absolutely nothing about that cartridge. Was it designed specifically as a just a heavy subsonic round? Yes, it's it's based on the 338 Lapua case cut down ah. to slightly more than two inches and loaded with a standard 50 caliber ball or a specific subsonic armor piercing or ball projectile or solid uh, turn it solid brass slug for maximum precision and uh, shoot through a special designed uh, bullpup bolt action rifle. Okay, so not semi-auto, just a, a bolt action. Uh, no. Okay. All right, and our very last question is from Adam says, why has Russia never moved away from the 7.62 by 54 rimmed? It would seem the number of generations of magazine and belt-fed weapons that have worked around the rim would eventually prompt a change to a, you know, a modern rimless cartridge. Uh, because it never had a chance to complete the switch. The attempts were made during <clears throat> 1930s. So a lot of work was done, was made, but when it's Preparation for a war, uh, then a great patriotic war, precluded any war of adoption of new cartridge. Then, in the 60s, it was attempt to produce a universal cartridge, ringless 7.62 cartridge, 
which would replace both assault rifle cartridge and machine gun cartridge. Not surprisingly, it failed. Okay. Then during the 70s, 80s, it was you know, attempts to produce a more flatter shooting cartridge with uh, flechette for firing ammunition, and then with six millimeter rimless cartridge, very fast, a very fast bullet. But then the Soviet Union fell and uh, development collapsed. And the key is that uh, the primary user of the rimless cartridge is a machine gun. And in fact, with the PKM, we have an excellent machine gun, which cannot be made any better with the introduction of rimless cartridge. In fact, it became, became heavier. Right. We have a new set of problems. Yes. People have issues designing a magazine holding more than 10 cartridges for a rifle. But I know that right now people are working on commercial 20 round cartridge for SVD or for mm -hmm. Tiger rifle. And a lot of people are waiting for it to be completed, to buy it just to have. And probably some people from the forces, law enforcement, will also buy it just to try because sometimes. It's better to have 20 cartridges to the SVD than to 10. Okay. It really is interesting to look at the context of the main gun being the PK, which works great with rimmed cartridges. Um, so, yeah, if, if it's just the PK and the Dragunov, really, that are using it, you can, it, it's easier to put in the work to make a larger magazine for the Dragunov, which certainly can be done. You know, the British made 30 round Bren gun magazines for 303 rimmed. Um, easier to do that than try and develop a whole new rifle and machine gun for a new cartridge. So, cool. Um, anything else you want to add in that, uh, that we skipped over? I think I have enough. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a, another question uh, session sometimes later, but I think there could be a lot of more questions. But right, right now, I think. Okay. I think we've got a lot of great information there for people. Um, thank you very much for coming on and, and doing this. Thank Q &A. you for inviting me. It was a pleasure to. All right, guys. Well, thanks again to all of our patrons who submitted uh, a couple dozen questions here for us and uh, stick around. I'm sure we'll have some more videos with Max coming up later. Thanks for watching.